Well, good morning. So most people know something about Daniel, Daniel in the lion's den maybe, or maybe they know about uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but we have a real treat. A lot of people have said they love the book of Daniel. So uh, if you get a chance, maybe uh, we're going to start in chapter one. You can read that this week. And today we're going to talk about, this whole series is about rising above circumstances. Um, Because the truth is, all of us are going to have circumstances in our lives that we don't control. Uh, Some of you that are here today are dealing with maybe a physical problem that you have that you can't do a thing about. Uh, Maybe it's an emotional thing that you're dealing with and you're struggling with something. Maybe it's a hurt from the past and you just don't know how to get past it. Um, It could be that somebody's hurt you, uh, undeserved, and that does happen, by the way. Um, You know, uh, sometimes in life things happen. You can be a perfect person and they'll put you on a cross. You hear me? So no matter what happens in this life, this is not heaven. And so we'll have struggles. And in the story today, when you look, you have um, this story of these young men who struggled by no fault of their own. They were put in a situation that I can't even imagine. By the way, when you were 13, 14, 15, 16 years of age, would you have stood up in front of people and danced? Uh, These kids, I'm just amazed. I'm looking forward to VBS this week. And so um, when I look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, these guys about 14 years of age are dragged away from home, put into service in a foreign land that they know nothing about. Totally different language, mixed with people from all different places, all at one time, and conquered. Um, And what they told them was, hey, your God failed, our God wins. And so we'll be talking about that a little bit today because the truth is for us, when we go through a struggle and a trial, it's very confusing for us. And some of you are there. You're still dealing with this overwhelming sense of just being rolled over. Let me me give you an illustration. So when I was in college, I used to surf. Now, somebody said, have you gotten too old to surf? No, no. I'm not too old to surf. I'm just too lazy to surf now. It's way too much work. And uh, that's, that's the absolute truth. I, I don't even do, people said, you should do the stand-up paddleboard. I'm like, you have used two words that I don't even like in that sentence. Stand up. I, I, kayak. Kayak, you sit. You sit down. You relax. It's, you can take a nap. In a, you can't take a nap on a paddleboard. Some alligator will grab you off of that thing. All right. So I used to surf, and uh, many people would call me a poser. If you don't know what that is, it means... You really don't know how to surf, but you're pretending. But we would actually go in West Palm Beach, and we would go to some of the places that people like Kelly Slater would go and surf these awesome waves. And so these guys from college, I was not that great of a surfer. But these guys from college talked me into going with them before a tropical storm. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And so people don't realize this. It's not the big waves that are a problem. Big waves actually, especially when they're clean waves, are very easy to paddle out through. People don't know that. It's like cutting butter on a perfect day. I don't even know how to explain the feeling. When there's a perfect wave, no matter how big it is, you can push right through. It's called a duck dive. You push right through it. It's great. But there are before tropical storm days. And it's when you look out at the waves and you just see white water after white water after white water. They call it the washing machine if you're a surfer. And how that works is you think you're going to make it out and all of a sudden that wave breaks and becomes white water. And there is no way for you to push your board far enough down to go through it. So you either get smacked in the face and carried to the shore on your board or you jump off your board. You allow this device, which is called what? A leash, which is a great name. And by the way, if you're a boogie boarder, this hooks to your wrist. If you're a surfer, this hooks to your ankle. Don't mix the two up. It's very embarrassing to have somebody with a boogie board with a leash on. And what happens? You jump off your board, and here's what you learn. Listen, a new surfer thinks they can hang on to their board and make it through anything. And they get beat up because they try to maintain control of their board and they just get beat, beat, 
be, and, and you feel like you're going to die. And then a wave will roll you over with your board and catch you in the wave and just over and over and over. And you are underwater and getting beat up. Can you tell I have experience with this? <laughs> but if you're smart, you'll learn to trust your leash. You'll jump off your board. You'll go under the wave and know that in a minute... After that wave breaks, this will bungee back your board and you'll be able to pull it towards you and then you'll be able to paddle out to cleaner waves where you can actually go under them or over them. Now, here's the truth about life. When you and I try to maintain control on our own of situations, by the way, life changes. You you have situations come at you that you did not cause that you did not make happen, that overwhelm you. Maybe it's a doctor's report where they say, hey, this is what's going on, and you're like, what? I've always taken care of myself. Look at Pastor Eric. He's in awful shape. Why doesn't he have that problem? I get people mad at me when I tell them my cholesterol levels. They're like, what? That is totally unfair. You eat way more worse than I do. And I'm like, I know. So things happen. You hear things. People respond to you. Maybe you lose your job suddenly by no fault of your own. Something happens. And and here you are under the wave getting tossed and tossed and tossed. And will you hang on to God's word and a relationship with Christ? Because if you'll hang on to those two things. And in this study today, I put a New Testament verse that you can put somewhere when you need a reminder of how good God is. To remind you through God's word that no matter what wave you're under right now, he's hanging on to you. Don't give up hope when you feel upside down, when you feel like you're not going to take another breath and you just wonder, am I ever going to come up for air? He can take care of you and he's with you, whatever the trial that you're going through is. Because when you try to hang on, when we try to hang on, we get frustrated, we get angry. We get irritated. We wonder why God's left us. I can't believe this. And we just get beat up. But when we finally say, God, I'm yours. And we'll look at three things today. How you can trust the leash of God's word and trust Christ to help you walk through. So here's number one. Choose rest and trust. One of the hardest things to do when you're getting beat up by waves is to relax. They've done studies of people, and sometimes in our fear response, we give the worst response ever. There was actually a a show I was watching the other night about stress and how our brains respond to stress. And it was showing this lady who had gone through a hurricane in Puerto Rico. And as she went through the hurricane, she had her two daughters, and all of a sudden, she was overwhelmed so much with fear that she could not respond. So she decided, I'm going to take trauma courses to look at traumatic uh, uh, events to overcome this. I've got to learn not to overreact because when we do, what happens? We lose our way. So let's pick up Daniel chapter 1. We're going to read verse 1 and then we'll assume the exile and then we'll head up to verse 3. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Now you've got to realize Nebuchadnezzar Incredible king, city of Babylon, created the Ishtar Gate. I'll talk about that in a minute. All kind of awesome things and was taking over at this time all different groups. A group called the Phoenicians. Uh, The Phoenicians were the ones that, that helped us develop a written language that we could communicate with other people. All these different groups were being pulled aside. Isaiah in chapter 39 actually prophesied this. Then the king ordered... As Phinez, chief of his court officials. So they've been taken into captivity, captivity, and it says, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. So these guys that we learn about later, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, 
were taken not only from home, but they were taken from wealthy communities. They were taken from an easy life, and all of a sudden, they're subjected to total change. Imagine, by the way, uh, Plato says uh, that they would do this at about 14 years of age. Now, I don't know what you remember about being 14, but that was not the most stable years of my life. But your self-esteem probably was not established really well. And so when you think of them being 14 and what happens next, it really shows you God's hand on them. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians, some of the first libraries in the world. So you didn't have to just learn from experience, you could learn from someone else. By the way, it's no, no problem with learning from experience, but isn't it better to learn from someone else, not to touch the stove? That's why you have brothers, right? Go try it. Oh yeah, don't do that. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. So I want to, I want to tell you just a little bit about Babylon. There's something called the Ishtar Gate, and there's the Ishtar Gate, and then there's a, a place called the Way that they would have to walk down, and all the prisoners would be dragged through this gate. Now, in the middle of the desert, as you were dragged away from home, you all of a sudden would see this large, blue, blinding gate. They had formed these bricks. And by the way, the front gate has been recreated in Germany at the Berlin Museum. So if you ever go to Berlin, go see just the front gate. It's not the biggest one, but it's there. And they recreate it, and they actually are using parts of it. You can actually go to several different places to see parts of this. See, as they went in, there would be uh, uh, these huge uh, life-size lions, and they would have uh, uh, unicorns. They had a dragon, and these things represented their God. And, and they would be, it was 50 foot high, the first gate. And then there was a mile walk with these huge figures all over these pillars as you walked for a mile past all of these bright blue, shiny figures. You would be dragged in in chains. They would be in a processional, pulled along, and they would walk in from a stark, bright desert into this amazing building. Nebuchadnezzar built it. They actually found the inscription, and he said, if this ever falls down, because it was a prophecy, it would fall down. If this ever comes down, I would like somebody to rebuild it, which Saddam Hussein started. So they would be dragged down here. They would see these huge lions, and they would be overwhelmed. By the way, if you ever go to Chicago, if you ever go to New York, um, I think there's actually one in, let me see where it's at, in Boston and Rhode Island, in the, in the museums there. You can actually see one of the original lions that was on the wall that these guys would have been dragged through. And so here they were overwhelmed by all of this, and they were being told, this is what we want you to do. Here's what the Bible says when you're in a situation that you can't do anything about. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. This is actually an Old Testament passage. In all your ways, submit to him. And in the King James, it says acknowledge him. But it's the idea of being under his authority. And he will make your paths straight. Do you realize no matter what's happening in your life, here's what you need to realize. Even if somebody else causes your pain, you are responsible for your choices. That means that you can't respond to everything that happens to you. That's how you're different than an animal. That's why when I drive, there's not lots of dead bodies on the side of the road. Because I can't tell you the number of times that I thought I break for tailgaters. Right? But I don't. Right? And somebody cuts me off and I think, wow, I could just pit maneuver them. If you don't know what that is, Google that. Right? So all kind of things go through your mind which are not positive or good things. That doesn't make it a sin. It's when you act on it. And so I'm sure Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel all struggled with feeling sorry for themselves. I'm sure as they were dragged in, the whole point of all this awesomeness was to make them feel like you are nothing. You have been defeated. You have been conquered. You don't matter. And when you go through a hard time, can I tell you, those are the exact same feelings you're going to have. 
that you don't matter, that you've been dragged away and it's not your fault and there's nothing you can do about it. And here you are, you might as well just surrender now. But you're still responsible for God's part in your life, no matter what your circumstances. See, they didn't make excuses for why they weren't obeying God. They just decided to obey God. That's number two. Ask God for direction and for favor. We seek that in God's word. You know, the problem with our direction sometimes in this life is the world tells us that you just decide how you feel and that's what you choose. And so if you feel like doing something, just do it. You know, you were born that way. So you just act on whatever you're feeling. Listen, I'm telling you, you don't have to act on your feeling. You need to have a guide. How do I know that? My son Kyle bought his first grill. I was so proud as a dad. July 4th, he buys a grill. I, I, could, I could hear flags in the background. God bless America. It just felt so American. You know, he's buying a grill. There's probably going to be bratwurst on it, which aren't American, but still you have to cook some. And then hamburgers, some hot dogs. And so he calls me. He says, Dad, I, I got to know how to cook hamburgers. So I, so I go over it with him. And I said, you know, and he said, I got a thermometer. I said, that's awesome. I said, now, with a thermometer, I said, now, you can look it up, but I think it's about 150 is the temperature you want those hamburgers, and we kind of talked through it. Now, if you discover what happened next, please don't yell it out as two people did last night. As Kyle cooked the hamburgers, he, he didn't call me on the phone. He decided he was going to do it. I had already given him lessons, so he had the thermometer, and he cooked them for a few minutes, and he flipped them, and they started looking done, and he put the thermometer in there, and it said 90 degrees, and he's like, no way, this is not working. Now, I had told him it's easier to cook with the grill open because when you close it, you pretty much create fire burgers. If you haven't learned that lesson yet, you can come to my house, and I'll show you how to do that. So he closes the grill thinking, maybe my grill's not working right. i got to get them hotter. And he gets them hotter and he opens it up and he puts the thermometer in there and it says 100 degrees. And he's like, wow, they're really not cooking. So then now he cranks the heat up on the grill. He closes the grill. And then a little bit later, he sends me a picture of something that looks like hockey pucks. <laughs> and then he took a look at his thermometer and he realized he had set it on Celsius and he had cooked his hamburgers to about 290 degrees, and they were unedible. Now, here's the truth about life. You've got to have a guide to what is wrong and what is right, or you'll just set the thermometer to whatever you want it. We believe that God's Word guides us. That's the reason we need Scripture. It's the reason we do VBS. We don't do VBS because we need something to do. Trust me, I don't, I don't need anything else to do. We don't do VBS because pastor wants to lead recreation. Trust me, in the summer, in July, I do not want to lead recreation. But you know what I want to do? I want to see kids hear about God's word so they grow in him and come to know him. And I see them live their lives for him as they discover his word. Pick up in verse 8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food. By the way, back then, that was pork and horse meat. Mmm, delicious. And wine. And he asked the chief officials for permission not to defile himself in this way. Time out real quick. Notice that even though he was under a foreign leader that didn't believe in God, that was asking him to do something that was against his religion, he started by asking and putting himself under authority. Paul talks about this in the New Testament, about us being under authority of those over us. At the time Paul wrote that, we were dealing with Nero, the worst leader ever for Christians. And yet Paul said, submit to the authorities. It's a sign of being a Christian. Now, God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. And then Daniel presents, in the next few verses, the veggie test. Now, this word for vegetables, by the way, also represented grains. It wasn't just veggies. He wasn't just going to eat vegetables. It represented other things, too. But he basically said, hey, instead of giving us this, give us that. And if we look okay, then, well, here's what it says. 
At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and wine that they were to drink and gave them these vegetables instead. See, they obeyed God and didn't know what would happen. See, we're to obey God and trust the consequences to Him. James 1.12 says this, Blessed is the one who gives up when they're in trial. No. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. What does persevere mean? It means you, you stand up under that weight. Because having stood the test, the person will receive the crown of life the Lord has promised to those who love Him. So what do we need to do? Seek God in His Word and prayer. See, if you're going to have the right thermometer, you can't just fill your mind with the news media all the time. And I don't care which news media you listen to, if you watch that all the time, it's poisoning you. I don't care if you've got the best station and you know they're telling you the truth. Can I tell you, the truth is found in God's Word. And if that's not number one in your life, then your thermometer is off. And you think you're right, but you're getting Celsius. And you're wondering why you're angry. And you're wondering why you're scared. And you're wondering why you're frustrated. It's because all day long you listen to messages of fear and anger. And how dare they do that. And every day, oh, I can't believe so-and-so did that. And you listen to that all day long. And you wonder, gosh, why am I having such a hard time? Daniel and his friends knew Scripture. They knew what God had called them to do. And they knew that was the standard. So even though they were being told all kinds of things from every direction, they knew that was not the standard. Here's the main verse I'm going to give you in the book of Daniel. And I love this verse because it tells you about life. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego getting ready to go in the fiery furnace. They say to the king, basically about God, God will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But, I love this, even if he doesn't, We want you to know, your majesty, we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Basically, we're going to do what God wants us to do regardless of the consequences. Number three, recognize your blessings. Recognize your blessings. Can I tell you something about life? This week I had a tree cut down in my yard, 80 foot pine tree. I will tell you when that thing hit the ground, it is the coolest sound in the world. I wish I could reproduce it for you. It is something between a shuttle launch and an explosion. The ground shakes. The dogs all bark. It's awesome. Horses whinny. It's great. This guy came to my house. He actually attached something to the top of the tree. He had a whole crew with him. He cut that tree, and all of a sudden that tree started falling. And can I tell you what he could do after the tree started falling? Get out of the way. And sometimes in life, all you can do when life happens, when people hurt you, when somebody attacks you, when things go wrong, all you can do sometimes is say, God, I can't do anything about this, but trust you in the middle of it. And I can look at the blessing I have, even as the tree falls, even as this situation happens, even as this loss happens, even as this pain happens, I can look around and see what you've done. Big wave surfers say that when they get caught in a wave and flipped over and their leash is holding, but they're underwater and in really big waves, it seems like forever till they come up. They say they learn to relax. They learn to actually enjoy where they're at. They learn to say, wow, how awesome this is. When's the last time in the middle of your pain you realized that God was blessing you? You realize that Peter did not walk on water in smooth water. It was during a storm that he was blessed. So God may even use you in the middle of your storm to be a blessing. To these four young men, what happened? God gave knowledge and understanding of all kind of literature and learning. They would have never gotten this back at home. Yes, they had lots of loss. Yes, they had lots of pain. Yes, they had lots of suffering. Life was not as easy as it was at home, but they knew 
the blessings they had. That's why Daniel could talk about it later. Hey, we got to learn all this stuff we would have never learned. What has happened in your life because of the pain that's happened in your life? What good has come out of the hurt and the injustice and the thing that's happened to you that you did not deserve? And then it says, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kind. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief officials presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them. Now you realize, Nebuchadnezzar is like the head of the world at this time. And they come talk to Nebuchadnezzar. And here's what he discovered. He found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Got to say that one slowly. It's funny that later we always call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was actually their Babylonian names. So they entered the king's service in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them. He found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters. Basically, the astronomers, the astrologers, the people who did magic at that time. What they considered magic was probably chemistry. <laughs> He was wiser than all of them. By the way, Daniel later, you'll find out, is put in charge of these wise men, as they're called. You'll find out a little bit later in the New Testament that there's a group of wise men that came to see Jesus that bring gold and frankincense and myrrh, which most people believe is from the area of Babylon. It was almost like those wise men had heard stories their whole life from some Jewish young man who had told them about the future Messiah. Do you see how God can use the very thing that you think is your captivity to cause freedom for other people? God never wastes a hurt. So whatever pain you're dealing with right now, I want to encourage you, let God use that in your life. This is a verse for you. And the God of all grace, who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ after you suffered a little while, after you're off your board and getting rolled around and you don't know if things will ever come back to normal again, after a little while, what He's going to do? He's going to restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Now, for some of you, for many of you, and I think for most of you, that will happen on this earth. But for some of you, it won't. And either way, God promises that regardless of what happens to you, the suffering you endure, God will overcome and will restore you. And guess what? You'll be stronger than you ever were, just like these young men. So what, do we, what can we do in the middle of trials and struggles we can't control? We can count our blessings. No matter what you're going through, there are blessings in your life right now. There are blessings all around you. I encourage you to take a walk, look around, thank God for the things that are around you, for the things that you are exposed to, that the, the fact that you have clothing on your body and food in your stomach and so many blessings that we have. Take a few minutes to count your blessings because if you try to hang on to the past, and the way things used to be, and the way you think they are, and if you walk in fear and anger and frustration all the time, they're just going to get rolled over and over and over. But if you'll let go of that and say, God, you know I didn't cause that to happen. Or if you did, you say, God, forgive me for causing that to happen. And you trust him even in the storm and the waves as you get rolled over. He'll give you peace that passes understanding in the middle of the struggle and the trial, if you'll seek his direction, his favor, and recognize his blessings in the middle of whatever you're going through. If you're here today or you're watching online and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. Jesus came and died for us, led a perfect life, was crucified for our sins because we could never earn our way to heaven, so Jesus paid it all for us. And the Bible says when we surrender our lives to him, when we confess our sin and surrender it to him and say, God, I don't want to live my own way anymore. I want to live for you. And we trust that he died and rose again. The Bible says we are given eternal life. That our sin nature is taken away and he gives us a new spirit through his Holy Spirit and helps us walk the Christian life. Maybe you're here today and as a Christian you're going through a trial or struggle. Don't give up. Hang on. No matter what you're going through. And hey. 
Just like Daniel, God will also bring some friends around you if you'll let him to support you and encourage you even on your journey. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word, your power, your strength. Lord, I thank you even for the things that I've been through. Lord, the things I couldn't control, the things I couldn't fix, the frustrations that I even have now sometimes with the things that I wish I could take care of. But Lord, even in the middle of all that, I trust you. And Father, I pray for that one here today who's overwhelmed. They they may not even know they're overwhelmed with the pain that they've had. And so, Father, I pray even now that you would help them to relax in you and your presence. Father, we thank you that you control all things. I pray that we would put our minds on you, not on this world, not on the things around us, not on the things we're being told are important, but we would look and know what's important from your word and in your will. We trust you, Lord. We thank you for this morning. We pray that you'd bless each one. In Jesus' name, amen.